this is the so, huh? what um, <coughs> Build myself up to Vegas. I can't. Just drink what you want. Your first time in Vegas? I've been to Vegas. I know, but 21 though. 21 haven't been to Vegas yet. You're going to have a great time. Yeah, I'm going to have a great time.
The ones that we're going to go over today with regard to staph aureus, of course, they're more likely to appear right, so you definitely want those, and we're going to talk about these. But do be aware you could, you could indeed see any of these variants. So what we want to do right now then is we're going back to our um, comparing bacterial um, exotoxins and endotoxins. We blasted through a discussion of bacterial exotoxins last time. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to go through the bacterial endotoxins. And uh, remember, in the back of my mind, we're <coughs> comparing the endotoxins to the exotoxins. So first of all, on the table, it asks us, what is the composition of bacterial endotoxins? Bacterial endotoxins are the lipopolysaccharide of gram-negative bacterial cell walls. So remember, the lipopolysaccharide is found in that outer membrane of the gram-negative bacteria. And since it's actually a part of the cell wall, the endotoxins are not released in great amounts until the bacteria die. They lice, they start falling apart. So that's, um, that helps me just looking at the name endotoxin, it's like inside or a part of the bacteria cell itself. So again, um, endotoxins are not released in large amounts until the bacteria die. And that's going to be a challenge um, for you all if you're trying to treat or help patients that have gram-negative bacteria. Put them in their bloodstream. If you give them, if you give your patients antibiotics, what will happen to those gram-negative bacteria? What do you hope is going to happen to them? You give them antibiotics and you're hoping they will like die, right? But when they start dying, they're going to release what? Massive, quantity, massive quantities of endotoxins. So we have to be prepared for the consequences, which we'll soon discuss. Now, whenever bacteria are growing and replicating, they do release tiny amounts of lipopolysaccharide. Um, but again, they're going to release huge amounts when they die in mice. Okay. So the location of the toxin, the endotoxin we said, it's in the, um, it's the lipopolysaccharide in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. So consequently, which groups of bacteria can make endotoxins? Can gram-positive make endotoxins? No. No, right? Only gram-negative. Gram-negatives, dynamite, you guys. So only gram-negatives can make endotoxins. Um, is the toxin heat sensitive? This is bad news, guys. Endotoxins are not heat sensitive. They remain, um, even after autoclaving. And that's so important for us to know, to remember, especially if you think, oh, I've got a, um, maybe uh, some extra um, IV fluid <coughs> left, and I don't want to waste them, so I'm going to autoclave them, and that will kill any bacteria present. But remember, you guys, if, if, if that, those um, intravenous <coughs> fluids had, been, had become contaminated from negative bacteria, if you were to autoclave them, of course it will kill the bacteria. But will that endotoxin still be present and active? Yes. Yes, it will. So boy, is that an important thing to remember, right? Autoclaving will not inactivate endotoxins. What a bummer. Okay, the next one is toxicity. And uh, toxicity is, well, we'll see, um, how much of the toxin is required to cause harmful effects? And good news with endotoxins is they have relatively low toxicity, meaning it takes a lot of them to trigger harmful effects. But again, if we have a patient that has gram-negative bacteria growing in their bloodstream and, they, and those bacteria start to die, that's a massive amount of endotoxin that will be released. So toxicity effect on body and pharmacology. You all will remember with the exotoxins, we said they're very specific for specific cells, specific tissues. There were neurotoxins and enterotoxins. Um, but in contrast, the endotoxins have the same general impact on um, the human host. So we're just going to walk through that really quickly here. So it turns out when these endotoxins are released, what we're going to describe here is a phenomenon called endotoxic shock or sepsis. So this is, this is the process we're going to be describing here. Okay, so we have lysis of our gram-negative bacteria causes the massive release of um, endotoxins. And I'll put a big arrow up showing what we want.
responses. But cytokines should only be released in tiny amounts in localized areas. The problem with endotoxins is these endotoxins cause massive release of cytokines. So our body is flooded with cytokines. And they often describe this as a cytokine flood or cytokine storm. And in these large amounts circulating throughout our body, the, this, um, the cytokines are going to cause some really harmful um, effects. So with the release of those cytokines, we see changes in our blood vessels. We're going to see vasodilation, where the diameter of our blood vessel becomes larger. And we're going to see an increase in vessel permeability. Our vessels become leaky. Our vessels become leaky. And we're going to see, gosh, this looks a lot like the initial stages of inflammation. And in fact, some biologists describe sepsis as um, um, an overblown state of inflammation throughout the body. Now, with the combined vasodilation and increased vessel permeability, what do you think will be the effects on blood pressure? It's going to go down. It's going to crash. Okay, so we'll have a big drop in blood pressure. And as a, as a consequence of this drop in blood pressure, we won't get as much blood delivered to our vital organs. Right? So this will often throw people into um, hypo, hypotensive, hypotensive shock, which is part of the shock component. So for example, kidneys start shutting down, you know, your brain starts shutting down. Um, we need blood flow, right, for these organs to, to function properly. And as if that's not bad enough, you know, this, this uh, lack of blood flow, um, the cytokines can trigger a phenomenon called DIC. And DIC stands for disseminated, which means spread throughout the body. Disseminated into a vascular means within the blood vessels. Coagulation. And coagulation is another term for blood clotting. So your patient can start throwing little tiny blood clots um, throughout the bloodstream. And those little blood clots can block capillaries, and that's going to further decrease blood flow to vital organs. Okay, so we start throwing little clots, block blood flow. Okay, so we can see the combination of these two events, the decrease in blood pressure triggering the disseminated intravascular coagulation with all the little blood clots. We're going to have a de decreased blood perfusion <coughs> tissues. And in the old days, they said this would cause MOSF, which stands for multiple organ system failure. All your organs start to shut down, right? And what can happen, of course, is that if, if you're not able to reverse this, um, you go into shock, and it can lead to death. And the, the challenge with this is, is that your patient can be entering the early stages, and you don't know they're starting to go into um, endotoxic shock. And then once it starts, it's very hard to reverse. So it's, it's a huge issue in emergency rooms, you know, to know whether people, if endotoxic shock and um, this gram-negative sepsis could be um, part of the underlying issue. So as we mentioned, you know, the irony of this is if your patient is suffering from gram-negative bacteria growing in their bloodstream, your instinct is to kill them, right? Not kill those gram-negative bacteria. But again, remember you guys, that's going to cause even more release of endotoxin. So following antibiotic therapy, you might help you know, throw your patients into um, endotoxic shock. So um, some of the therapies that are used to try to support patients through this crisis is obviously um, IV fluids, right? To try to keep the blood pressure up. That's a big one, trying to keep that blood pressure up. Um, with um, kidney failure, the patient might be put on dialysis. Um, there might be a need for respiratory support. But this is a tough one, you guys, because it can, it can advance so rapidly. It can advance so rapidly. Okay, so, so with our endotoxins, instead of saying, oh, this endotoxin will attack the nerves and this other endotoxin will attack the cells of the respiratory tract, 
with endotoxins, it's this, this general um, cascade of events that would be triggered with a massive release of endotoxins. Okay, so that's the effect on body pharmacology. Mm -hmm. The next term, you guys, it says pyrogenic. And what are pyromaniacs? <coughs> pyromaniacs are people who love to start fires, right? So pyrogenic means fire producing, fire generating. So it's a term we use for a substance if it triggers fever production in a patient, right? And it turns out one of these cytokines that's released will um, actually trigger fever production. So we do say that endotoxins are pyrogenic. You're, you would see a fever um, as the endotoxins are released. And the next thing you guys is so important. Can the endotoxin be made into a toxoid? And you'll recall a toxoid is a toxin that's been modified so that it no longer can cause harm, but it will still trigger a protective immune response. You'll still get production of neutralizing antibodies. They can bind not only to the toxoid, but which can also bind to the original toxin. And you all remember neutralizing antibodies are dynamite because they block attachment of, in this case, the toxin to our cells. And if the, the, the toxin can't bind to our cells, then we aren't gonna have any disease, right? Well, here's the hard way, you guys. The actual, the actual toxic portion of the lipopolysaccharide is actually the lipid A is the actual uh, toxic portion. And lipids are lousy antigens. Antigens are substances which trigger immune responses. So lipids are horrible antigens. So it turns out we cannot make toxoids out of endotoxins, right? And, and, and that's going to be linked to our inability to create a vaccine to protect people against endotoxic shock. That would be dynamite. We had a vaccine to protect people again against um, sepsis, endotoxic shock. Oh, that would be so wonderful. But again, the endotoxin makes a bad um, antigen. You can't make it into the toxoid. And that's linked to the next one down here. The antitoxins, neutralizing antibodies, we produce against the toxin. And the problem is, again, we, we can't. We can't make good neutralizing antibodies against this horrible antigen, this lipid A portion of the polysaccharide. So we don't have any vaccines to protect people against um, endotoxic, endotoxic shock. Yeah. There was a question you guys, I'm sorry. Question or comment you all have? Okay. So um, that's the happy news with endotoxin. So again, it takes large amounts of endotoxin to cause serious harm and death. But in a patient, again, that's um, infected, say, with gram-negative bacteria in the bloodstream, this can definitely be a life-threatening situation. Yeah. Okay, folks, so what we're next gonna do then is um, to finish our little discussion of virulence factors is um, I'm gonna take a subset of the virulence factors that may appear on your lecture exam. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use an example of one of the most brilliant invasive pathogens, um, one of the most brilliant <coughs> bacterial invasive pathogens, Staphylococcus aureus. Now we're gonna show how Staph aureus can use some of these virulence factors to invade us and spread throughout our body. So, um, the single page handout from today, you guys, uh, this is a cartoon of the story we're going to tell. Um, we'll be recreating parts of the cartoon. But on the back, you guys, just so we understand that our story today, we're only touching on a few of the variance factors that Staphylococcus aureus can make. On the back of the cartoon is a table listing <coughs> the incredible variety of variance factors that Staphylococcus aureus can make. And hopefully this will let us appreciate why staph aureus infections are so serious. Why staph aureus is such a brilliant tissue invader. And why we really need to have great respect for even, even the tiniest little staph aureus infection. We need to be aware that staph aureus can have this arsenal of weapons against our defenses that could permit it to rapidly spread and disseminate to our body. So again, we're just going to try to recreate this little cartoon here just, just to kind of see the logic behind how some of these virulence factors are used. All right, so later today we're going to start talking about um, human defenses, you know, how, how we protect ourselves against some of these organisms. So
So we're going to see how SAP Aureus has evolved ways to outwit our defenses. You know, it's kind of like this evolutionary dance, evolutionary cha-cha-cha. A pathogen evolves a virulence factor. We evolve ways to kind of cope with that. The pathogen evolves ways to cope with our defenses. So it's kind of this evolutionary back and, back and forth little dance that we're doing with these guys. Oh, no. So, one of the most important parts of our natural defenses um, we'll be discussing are um, skin and mucous membranes. So we'll just pretend, you guys, this is epithelial cells. Um, so this is the nucleus. Okay, and part of the normal defenses of epithelial cells of skin or mucous membranes is that the cells are uh, tightly adherent. There's like little protein lizards that help hold them together. And in addition, there's this really cool substance that the cells produce um, that we'll just call inter intercellular cement. So this orange represents this what we call intercellular cement. It's sticky. It helps our cells literally stick together. And again, that's important because we do not want all these little blue balls for our staph aureus. We don't want staph aureus to be able to move between our cells to penetrate some deeper tissue, right? So that's part of our normal defenses, having these tightly adherent cells. Well, what staph aureus has evolved is an enzyme called hyaluronidase. And some people often refer to it as spreading factor because the hyaluronidase made by the staph aureus can hydrolyze the intracellular cement. It has a high composition of hyaluronic acid. So the staph aureus hyaluronidase digests or hydrolyzes the intracellular cement, and that permits them then to pass between cells to penetrate to deeper layers. Okay, so that's, that's a pretty sneaky weapon to use against us. Now, once staph aureus invades into deeper levels, we'll see that it will trigger an inflammatory response. And an important part of the inflammatory response is that our white blood cells, our phagocytic cells, our professional phagocytes, eating cells such as neutrophils and macrophages will be attracted to the site of invasion. Okay, so staph aureus uh, will need a way to protect themselves from the arrival of the first responders will be the neutrophils. So one of their defenses is they have a capsule. And you all remember that capsules are antiphagocytic. The reason being, for our phagocytic cells to attach to the staph aureus, the phagocytes have special surface receptors that must be able to bind to something on the surface of the pathogen. And it turns out our phagocytes don't have receptors that bind to the polysaccharides of bacterial capsules. So consequently, our phagocytes, they can't attach to the pathogen. They just keep slipping away, keep slipping away. So the staph aureus capsule then is protection against the phagocytes. They can't attach to the, the encapsulated bacteria. But that's not all, you guys. Oh, staph aureus. It's just, it's like the, the wizard. It just keeps pulling virulence factors out of its path or capsule. I don't know where. Okay, so in addition, what the staph aureus will do early in infections They'll start producing an enzyme called coagulase. There's that ASE candy telling us it's an enzyme. And the first part is telling the function. So coagulase is an enzyme that triggers formation of fibrin clots, little blood clots around the staph aureus. Okay, so coagulase is going to trigger formation of this little fibrin, I'm going to call it a fibrin port. Okay, around this, the invading staph aureus. So it triggers fibrin formation. So we can think of this as a, like a little clot, a little tiny abscess perhaps. Now we might ask, well, why is that helpful? Well, the fibrin clot physically protects the staph aureus from phagocytes that are arriving to destroy <coughs> these guys. So I'll just draw some, I'll, we'll pretend these are neutrophils. Okay. And often biologists say these phagocytes become frustrated or frustrated phagocytes because they're being drawn to the site of staph aureus invasion, but they cannot physically work their way through the fibrin to, um, 
to make physical contact with the staph aureus. So the coagulase, we could argue, uh, in forming this fibrin clot, helps protect the staph aureus from phagocytes. So, in this little fibrin formin, the staph aureus are relatively safe. They can use nutrients from our body. They can start growing and dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing. So if you were that staph aureus right there, you guys, and if you were, if you had a brain, use our imagination, what are your feelings as the population inside the fibrin core continues to grow and divide? Are things getting crowded? Yes. yes. Yeah, maybe our nutrients may be getting a little bit limited. Yeah, maybe some nasty metabolic uh, byproducts, some acids are starting to build up, right? Okay. So, if you were that staph aureus right there, what would you like to do? Do you want to stay there or do you want to break out? Break and out. Spread elsewhere? You want to break out, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a problem here, and that is you're still pumping out all this coagulase, which is making, you know, this fiber fork. So we got, now instead of thinking of it as a fort, let's think of it as a fibrin prison that you want to break out of, right? So what you need to do, you need to turn off the genes for coagulase production, and you need to turn on another gene that, uh, that's for a protein called staphylokinase. Okay, so. The new gene you need to turn on is for an enzyme called staphylokinase. And staphylokinase helps trigger breakdown of fibrin. So as a result of turning off coagulase genes and turning on the staphylokinase genes, the fibrin port walls are broken down, and that's going to permit escape escape of the staph aureus. Now, you, you can rightly argue that, wait, all these phagocytes are waiting, right? Are waiting to kill the staph aureus. And you're absolutely right. Some of the staph aureus will be consumed by the waiting phagocytes. But did you notice how they waited until they had really high numbers before they made their escape, right? So that guarantees that at least some of the staph aureus will get past those phagocytes. The phagocytes can only eat so fast, right? So that will guarantee that, that many of the staph aureus will escape. They won't be exotized, they won't be destroyed. And then they're gonna to spread to other parts of the body and start this process all over again. Now the question we wanna ask, how, how then does the staph um, know, quote unquote, when to turn off the coagulase genes and turn on the staphylokinase genes? Okay, I mean, that's pretty tricky stuff, right? So what they've discovered is many, many, many bacteria, many pathogens use a process <coughs> of quorum sensing. And this is a process that, uh, by which bacteria can sense their population size. They can sense how many bacteria are present in their population. And in, in just a real simple model, you guys, what happens is the uh, bacteria produce chemicals, messengers called autoinducers. And so let's take a look 